If you're ready to get to the next level and step up your focusing game, then you need an electronic automatic focuser. And I'm going to tell you why you should consider the Ioptron IEF as your next or your first electronic automatic focuser for your telescope. Astrophotography is an expensive hobby, but after you do this for a while, or even when someone is starting out, they want to make life as easy as possible. And there are some upgrades that you feel that you need to do, including a really good tracking mount, a good camera, guiding, and electronic focusing. I've been using Botanoff masks like this for focusing for almost 13 years now, and these work really well. Something like this really steps up my game because not only does it help me focus from the get-go and save me anywhere from a couple of minutes to maybe even 15 minutes on a bad night, to making sure that my images have sharp stars all the way to the end of my imaging because as the temperature changes, as time changes, the focus on your telescope and your imaging rig changes over time. And with the bottom off mask, like once I said this, I set it and forget it. Yeah, it does change. And I do notice that sometimes my stars get a little bit bloated near the end of my session. And I, and it's really hard to just put this back on and then do another manual focusing because there's just not a lot of time and not a lot of motivation. But with something like this, you can automate refocusing your images after a certain number of frames, certain number of time an HFR change, I won't go into the details of what HFR is. Uh, James Lamb has a really good video on that. I'll link to that in the description below if you are interested in the technicalities of things. If you watch some of my older videos, you know that I'm a huge fan of Ioptron from my Sky Tracker Pro from however many years ago that I still use for a Milky Way imaging to the iPolar, which I still claim changed my life when I got it for my Celestron AVX mount years ago. And because I'm such a fan, it means so much more to me that Ioptron actually let me borrow this to use, test, and review. I believe this exact item was at Neef this year, so if you saw Ioptron at Neef, you may have run into this. And since this is a demo product, I am going to send this back after I'm done with it, and I'm going to immediately turn around and buy myself one of these because I don't think I can go back to using just a button-off mask. Aside from this loaner, I am not getting compensated in any way by Ioptron for this video. I've had the EAF for about seven weeks at the making of this video, and I've had the opportunity to use this in the field for a grand total of three times. The weather in New England has been horrendous this year so far. But in my three sessions, I was able to take a picture of galaxy and a couple of nebulae that I'll show you at the end of this video. And because this is a demo product, I don't have the original box that would normally come with this, but what I received was this IEF, the mounting bracket, a couple of these couplers, these adapters. I have two of them. Uh, luckily one fits my uh, refractors and the four hex poles that are necessary to attach this to my refractor. But if you were to get this brand new, what will come in the package for you is you'd get four focuser adapters, four, five, six, and seven millimeters. They also have an eight millimeter that's available. You'll get the mounting plate, two, three, and four millimeter Allen wrenches, a USB 2.0 cable, and a few M5 and M4 screws and washers to connect it all together. So I tested this with my Ascar 71F. You can see that I recently took this off. I also installed this on my AT60 ED, hoping to do a test at some point, but of course the weather did not cooperate, but installation and how it works should absolutely be the same because they're both small refractors. Looking at the specs of the IEAF, it weighs 254 grams for the focuser only, additional for the brackets and screws. The weight is always something to keep in mind if you're using a small mount like an AZ GTI because you may go over the recommended weight capacity of 11 pounds. This has a payload cap of 5 kilograms or about 11 pounds which should be more than enough for most setups. This works with just one wire, a USB 2.0, which supplies in the necessary five volts of power. This uses a stepper motor, and I calculated that it uses about 250 steps per millimeter of the focusing tube change, and that means that you can get extremely precise with this. It also has a built-in temperature sensor. I'll go over how I tested that shortly. And it also has manual control with built-in buttons, which is my favorite. I'll go over that soon as well. And of course, it's compatible with ASCOM, so you can use it with Nina, Indy, SGP, and any other imaging capture software that you may want to use. 
This comes with two very useful features, and the first one is the built-in temperature sensor. And by looking at this, you can see that the temperature sensor is built into the housing here. So the one thing to keep in mind is that there is some insulation between the outside air temperature and what the sensor in here sees. So to test this, I installed this on my telescope uh, and I left both of these running side by side for about half an hour in my ambient room temperature. And after half an hour, I took a look at what the temperature reading was between the two. And my thermostat read, 26.2 degrees Celsius versus the 28.18 degrees Celsius in the IEAF. So there's about a two degree difference. The next test I did is I turned on my air conditioner for about half an hour, made sure the room got a little bit cooler, and then I retested it, took another screenshot and a picture of my thermostat and this, and the reading there came out to 22 degrees Celsius for the thermostat and 24.5 degrees Celsius for the IEAF. So there's a difference between two and two and a half degrees uh, between what the thermostat is reading versus what the IEAF is reading. Even though there is a discrepancy between the two temperatures, it's not that big of a deal and I'll tell you why. And that's because in software like Nina and ECOS, we're looking for a delta in the temperature and which is just a change in temperature. And the IEF is detecting a temperature change and that's what we're looking for. So the fact that it is two degrees off the air temperature, it doesn't really matter because in Nina, we just say, hey, look for a change of five degrees Celsius from whatever the temperature reading was. Plus or minus half a degree, it'll, it's close enough to warrant a trigger to do an automatic focus once again in Nina. So that's just my two cents. If you feel differently, let me know in the comments below. The second built-in feature is the manual control buttons that come with the IEAF. This let you rotate the focuser after installation. And this is by far my favorite feature because it makes installation so easy because I can rotate it so that the flat part of the shaft is in a convenient location for me. Yes, it does require you to plug it into USB, but you can do this, you can plug it into a power bank temporarily, move it and unplug it. Just to put things into perspective about the IEAF, I thought I would compare it to two really well-known and popular electronic automatic focusers. The first one is the ZWO EAF, and the second one is the QHYQ focuser. So I picked some of the attributes that I think is important to many people here. So let's quickly go over them. So at first glance, it does look like the QHYQ focuser gives you the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to weight and payload. At only 210 grams, it gives you 10 kilograms of payload, a maximum payload, with the caveat that it only works with 10 kilograms for 12 volts of power. So that's another wire that needs to go into your Q focuser in order to give you the extra boost and torque that you need. Otherwise, I believe the payload is still five kilograms at five volts. We already went over the built-in temperature sensor of the IEAF. I did put a footnote here that says that it is inside the unit. For the ZWO EAF, you can buy an extra probe that connects to your EAF for an extra $12. Uh, it's $10 if you buy it with the manual control remote. And the QHYQ focuser comes with the external probe that's included in the price, which is kind of nice. Manual control for IEAF, it is built in, so it's built into the unit, nothing extra. But with the ZWO EAF, it's an extra 40 bucks, which is a remote that can goes into the same port that your temperature sensor would go into. So if you have both the temperature sensor and manual control, you have to pick which one you want included, uh, attached to your EAF. Uh, there's only one port for both of them, but you can get both of them for 50 bucks. So you save two bucks. And the QHF, QHYQ focuser, I said none with the footnote because there is a high precision focuser that allows manual adjustments after installation, but that will cost you another $30. And now backlash, ZWO and Ioptron claims that there's zero backlash. Of course, there's a footnote here that says the zero backlash depends on your entire focusing train, not just the focuser. So if your focusing train, if your focusing tube has some way, if your rack and pinion focuser has uh, a little bit of backlash, then you can't count on the zero backlash of the IEAF to do anything for you. You'll have to compensate for that in software as we saw in Nina. And the QHYQ focuser says that there's almost zero backlash. The power requirements, they're all similar, five volts for all of them, except the QHYQ focuser. You can also provide an extra 12 volts of power. And it's five volts is provided via, via USB-C, whereas the other two are just regular USB A and B. There is a 12 volt version of the ZWO EAF, but it was discontinued and it was replaced by a stronger five volts uh, pretty recently. And the price point for all three of these are the same. That's why I chose these three to compare. Installation is pretty straightforward. And I think the best method I found works that works best for me is 
a little bit backwards from what IOPTRON recommends in their documentation. So first I remove the coarse fo focusing knob from the telescope and find the right fit adapter. Then I install the adapter onto the focuser itself. Then loosely attach the bracket onto the focuser. I recommend connecting the focuser and turning it so that the flat part of the shaft is in a convenient location, like the top. Then loosely connect the mounting bracket, leave enough slack so that you can slide the focuser up and down if you need to make adjustments. Then push it into the telescope focuser shaft and make sure to adjust it so that the flat part of the shaft lines up with one of the screws and tighten all the bolts. Then finally tighten the screws on the adapter. I've gotten really fast with the install, especially since now I can leave the mounting plate and adapter connected to the IEAF when I disconnect and pack it up. Going over the software side to download the driver, you would go to the IOPTRON website. I'll link to this specific page in the description below. And then in the bottom here, under support documents, we have the ASCOM driver here, the IEF ASCOM driver, last updated in June 2023. Once you install it running, you'll see a pretty simplistic UI, exactly as we saw with my temperature test a little while ago. You can see the current position on the screen. I'd recommend that at this point, you manually move the focuser on your telescope all the way in using the push buttons. And once you're done, you set the current position to zero. It'll make remembering the position much easier later on. I've been doing this every time I reinstall the IEAF. And then in a capture software like Nina, under the focuser section, it'll come up as the IOPTRON standalone focuser. There's also an IOPTRON ASCOM driver. I believe this is older. It does it won't work with this version of uh, IEAF. So you do IOPTRON standalone focuser and you click on connect. And we have a similar UI to what the IOPTRON focuser UI has here. The only thing is we're missing is set current position to zero. So you do uh, need it. And then you can set the target position, move it, you can move it fast and slow, but we don't normally spend a lot of time in this section here anyway. Before we go into the imaging tab, I'll go to options. And under options, under autofocus, we have some settings here. And most of the options that I have here are the defaults here. So I haven't really changed anything. The only thing I've changed is probably the autofocus step size, which I do by 50. Cause remember I said 250 steps equals to one millimeter. So 50 steps is one fifth of a millimeter, which is, which is, uh, I found that it's quite nice for my setup to uh, do focusing, but you can go as, as little as one step if you need to, but you probably don't want to do that. Uh, the default autofocus exposure time is five seconds. I'll put this up to up to 15 seconds when I have my L extreme filter on a bad seeing night. Uh, and the only other non-default setting I have here is the R2 threshold. I set it to 0.3, which is pretty low. It should be around 0.8 or 0.9. I think the default is 0.8. Uh, the only reason I have 0.3 is because last time I was out, the seeing conditions were really bad and the HFR calculations were a little bit off. So setting it to 0.3 helped me out and I was able to get focus. The backlash in and out is by default zero and I kept it there because my entire imaging train doesn't actually have any backlash. So the Ascar 71F uh, promises no backlash and testing it, I can say that if there is any backlash, it's extremely tiny and I cannot notice it at all. And the IOPTRON IEF itself also doesn't have any backlash. Of course, the way I test it is just take my fingers and see if I can twist the thing, see if there's any give in any either direction. But remember that your setup may be different and your entire focusing train needs to be backlash free in order for this to remain at zero. And then when we go to the imaging tab, uh, on the top left here, you have the focuser option here. So if you don't see the focuser here, you can click on that and see where that appears. Uh, I have the default layout here. I reset it not too long ago uh, because I messed up a bunch of stuff. And you can control the focuser here as well. You probably don't, won't use this as much uh, if you're using autofocus. And then we have the autofocus tab here. And if you don't see this, it's this top right button here that says autofocus. So if you don't see autofocus, make sure you click that and then it'll appear on a tab somewhere or in a window somewhere and you can move that around. I put this here because uh, it's what makes sense to me. And then if I was imaging outside, uh, I would normally do the autofocus as part of my sequencer, but you can also come here and then click on start autofocus and it'll take whatever your position is. But remember that you need to be as close to focused as possible. This will just get you all the way where you need to be. And you click on start autofocus. I'm using Hocus Focus for my autofocusing. 
and it'll take a bunch of images around what you set your position to be. So I actually set my position to be 7225 because that's what I had uh, the previous time I went out and that worked for me. So I put that on there. And since we have the steps uh, focusing to four, it has four on this side and four on that side. And it increased by 50 each time. So you can see 7225, 7275. And then it found that 7203 like down here is where the where I get my best HFR, uh, the half flux radius. I won't go into the technical details of what that is, but I'll just say that that gives me really pinpoint starts. And this saves uh, your previous runs as well. So uh, this was, I think, one of the first times I ran it and you can see the HFR chart here looks really, really nice. And then when you look at this one, I think this is the one where I had to set the uh, HFR threshold or the R2 threshold to 0.3 because you can see I was getting some weird readings and and that seemed to help after a little bit of googling and it was very hot that night almost 29 degrees celsius and as mentioned in the beginning of this video I did this is a loaner product so I have to give this back and I'm really thankful for iOptron for working with me uh, and testing this out and reviewing this in this channel here are the three images that I took with my Astra 71F being auto-focused with the iOptron IEAF.